So good morning, folks here in, in Canada and certain time zones around the world. Good evening to others. Uh, my name is Jamie Smith, Director of Social Innovation with the Cody Institute and Extension Department at St. Francis Xavier University. And we are calling out to you today on, on Zoom, of course, from Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And as we are all treaty people, we do ask that you also reflect upon the Indigenous peoples who are in your place and the work and the offerings that they contribute to your local communities and the work that you can do together to create a more uh, resilient and full and abundant life for all people. So we are very pleased today uh, to have a panel with us building upon the conversations that have taken place uh, last in June the first in our series of the Future of Work and Workers webinar, uh, where we hosted over 300 people from around the world to come together to talk about the future of work and workers and moving towards a just transition for all people. Um, and especially at this moment in time, thinking about the impacts of COVID-19, the ongoing efforts to build more equitable communities, looking at and through the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so with us today, we're very pleased to have Bradley Day, a co-founder of Placemaking 4G and community activist in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Welcome to you, Bradley. Thank you for joining us. We also have Patricia Bradshaw, who is a past dean of the Sobe School of Business and and currently is the chair of the Community Sector Council of Nova Scotia. Thank you for being with us today, Patricia. Uh, we also have Brian Foster uh, with Autism Nova Scotia and Autism Nova Scotia was a partner with the Center for Employment Innovation and many others in the two year long New Opportunities for Work program. We're very pleased to have uh, Brian with us today and, and to speak to his work at Autism Nova Scotia. And also, and finally, we have Jennifer Watts, the CEO of the Immigrant Settlement Association of Nova Scotia and a member of the Center for Employment Innovations Advisory Body. So please, um, we do welcome all of you. Uh, we're looking forward to building upon the conversations that took place just a few months ago to learn more about the work that you've been engaged in and uh, to also think about the role of nonprofits and social enterprises as we think about the promotion of diversity, equity, and inclusion as we work towards a future that works for everyone. So on that note, I will pass it along to Yogesh Gore, one of the senior program staff with the Cody Institute. Thank you, thank you, Jamie, as always for your great introduction. And, and setting the context. Uh, and thank you everybody else uh, for joining from, from all across the world. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to all of you. Uh, it's a delight for me to be, to be facilitating this uh, session and this uh, distinguished uh, panel of uh, guest speakers on this very, very important topic of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, uh, for a just transition into, into a new normal, as we, as we are uh, calling it after, after the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, uh, let me first uh, set the context for uh, today's uh, conversation. Uh, as Jamie said, uh, the first webinar we had in uh, middle of June when we were all uh, under the lockdown or we were slowly, depending on where we, we are in the world, uh, in Canada, we were slowly starting to, to open up the economy in, in middle of June and that's when we had the first webinar. And accordingly, the topic of the first webinar was the impact of COVID uh, on, on work and, and, and workers. And uh, we had a good representation in the webinar, as Jamie said, we had uh, close to 300 people uh, um, uh, signed up. Uh, and we had a good representation also in terms of the sectors that were represented uh, in the webinar. So we had representation from the government, uh, uh, the, the local MP was there, and also from the, from the industry. Uh, we had someone, we had Kelly from the, <coughs> representing the trucking industry. But also we had representation from, uh, uh, we had diversity in the panel. So we had Alex Paul talk about uh, how the uh, pandemic was affecting the industry indigenous communities uh, here in Canada. Uh, we had Linda Thomas talk about how the pandemic was affecting uh, the black population here. So what came out of like, as a, as a, uh, from that discussion, uh, there were sort of uh, two takeaways that, uh, that came out very, very clearly. 
Number one was that um, uh, in, in, in this pandemic, it was like uh, we were all in the, in the same storm. We were all affected by the same storm, but we were all in different boats. So different people were affected differently uh, from the uh, pandemic. And those uh, who had the least ability to cope were affected the most. And in many cases, and, and uh, this is from our global experience, uh, because we have similar webinars and, and we are in touch with our partners and, um, and, and, and CODI uh, participants, is that many communities had a, um, had a choice to make. So for example, uh, the people working in the informal uh, economy, people working in the platform economy, we call, uh, they had a choice to make. Uh, and the choice was uh, whether to die from hunger or from the virus. So it was a tough, tough choice for, for, for some group. So one thing was very, very clear, and that was that there are, uh, there are some who are affected more than the others by the pandemic. The second uh, thing that came out very, very clearly was that although in many parts of the world, uh, the governments were very active, they, they had a response. Uh, even here in Canada, if you look at CERV uh, and others, so there was, there was immediate support available. But we all know that, and it was also clear in the, in the webinar, that uh, moving forward in terms of the recovery, in terms of uh, long-term rebuild, uh, rebuilding, governments alone cannot do it. And especially um, the kind of cracks uh, the, the pandemic showed us in terms of uh, inclusion and, and, and uh, the effect um, uh, different people were facing. So it was clear that others had to, uh, uh, had to, uh, to come up uh, to work with the, uh, with the government. Others had to participate in, in, in solutions. And one of the things was that uh, non-profits, non-profit organization, non-profit sector, and social enterprises also had a key role in ensuring that the, the new normal that is created uh, post-pandemic is more inclusive, more diverse, and, and more e equitable. So that was sort of the, the reason why we thought that the second we uh, webinar should be on the topic what we, what we learned from the first one, which is that, okay, there are certain groups uh, who are marginalized and excluded. So how do we actually, uh, what are the ways to, to ensure that uh, there's more inclusion moving forward, and specifically uh, the role of nonprofits and, and uh, social enterprises. And, and that's what you see, all the speakers uh, that we have today, and thank you very much for um, um, to each one of you for joining. So each one represents um, uh, nonprofits um, sector um, or social enterprise, and also they, uh, they work with certain groups to make sure that they are included uh, in their organization, but also more broadly in, in, the, in the workforce uh, and, and society at large. So what I'm going to do <clears throat> first is to invite each one of the guest speaker to, to speak uh, for about five minutes, uh, just to speak about who they are, what kind of work they do um, currently uh, to ensure actually uh, uh, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. Uh, in their organization as well as more broadly. Uh, and then um, I have a few questions that, uh, uh, that I will ask them uh, once they have done the introduction. And then we will open up the floor for, for question and answers. So you all can, uh, all the participants who have joined today, uh, you can type in your questions and, and I will try to ask, or me or Jamie will try to ask that questions to the, uh, to the guest speakers. Uh, but first, I would like to start uh, with, uh, uh, with a welcome to Patricia. Uh, she, I have requested her that uh, please, because we are going to be talking about the role of nonprofit and social enterprises uh, in this webinar, if she can provide a sort of a broad overview, how does the, the sector look uh, in Nova Scotia? And she very kindly agreed and she uh, made a few slides as well. So, um, and, and because she's providing this overview, uh, we are giving her five minutes extra. So she'll give, give, she will take about uh, 10 minutes to uh, explain uh, the background and also about her work at the, at the council. So over to you, Patricia. Uh, good morning and thank you. Um, very excited to be at my card table. Um, I will imagine I'm at a kitchen table and uh, I hadn't realized how international the audience is. So I'm really delighted that uh, I can share a, a bit of a story about Nova Scotia, I think as a case study. Uh, of what's happening around uh, the future of work and uh, and maybe we can use that as a platform for exploring uh, the future of work more globally. 
but uh, I'm going to start by just describing a little bit about the nonprofit sector in Nova Scotia and a little bit about the impact of uh, COVID-19. The sector in Nova Scotia, we've just uh, recently had a study completed by the Atlantic Provinces Economic Council, and it included both an economic impact study, but also a survey of over 500 nonprofits. So we have a pretty good picture. And we do know that it's a very large and diverse sector with over 6,000 nonprofit organizations that employ 20,000 people. And that's about the same size as the financial services and transportation sector in the province. It contributes 1.7 billion annually to the economy of the province, uh, in direct, indirect and induced contributions. So it's a uh, a vibrant and it's a very successful sector. Uh, about 30% of the nonprofits in our survey indicated that they have social enterprise activities uh, that may be complete uh, the whole part of their nonprofit or some portion of it. And uh, those are everything from sales of goods and services to catering businesses to uh, consulting and other kinds of operations. And the exciting thing about those is that often they're employing the clients that their uh, nonprofit has a mission to serve. So a lot of them, for example, are employing persons with disability and giving them opportunities to experience work themselves. This broad sector, as you can imagine, is uh, very uh, diverse and very um, small, made up of very small nonprofits. So 56% have revenues of less than a half a million dollars and 64% have fewer than 10 employees. So on average, we're smaller than uh, the nonprofit sector, composed of smaller nonprofits than other parts of the country. And it's also heavily reliant on uh, volunteerism which I think is a really important thing to understand that the 1 million people, fewer than 1 million people that live in the province contribute 74 million volunteer hours annually, and they contribute another $1.5 billion to the economy. And those volunteer hours are really significant. Um, it's an aging population, and that'll be a theme through my presentation. But APEC uh, assess that if the volunteer rate were to fall, to 46% from the current 51%, that would be the equivalent of losing 1,500 full-time employees. And if that happened, nonprofits are gonna to have to replace all those volunteers with paid workers to keep up the, the current uh, rate of contribution. So, you know, those volunteers are equivalent of 30,000 full-time employees and actually account for 60% of the labor force in this uh, province nonprofit sector. I don't think anybody will be surprised to learn that uh, the sector pays less than the uh, overall economy pays its workers. So on average, employees in the sector are making $24 an hour compared to $30 an hour for um, the rest of the industries. And uh, I know I'm going quickly, but I want to leave time for the discussion. So um, bear with me as I run through this. I think another important thing as we're factoring in diversity, equity, and inclusion is to look at uh, the leadership. As we uh, know that we have a lot of women, 67% uh, of the executive directors in the sector are women, uh, but they're on average older than other um, parts of the economy. So 45% are older than 55 years of age, and only 35% of the surveyed organizations have to even have a succession plan. So with that aging demographic, we're facing an aging leadership cohort. And that's going to mean a, a lot of hiring. And I would speculate that it's an opportunity to increase the diversity of who's leading our nonprofit sector. Uh, on the diversity front, uh, there's some good news. The survey, uh, as I said, showed that women play a heavy role, not only in the executive director positions, but overall 68% of the employees. But when you look at how we're doing compared to other parts of the economy in Nova Scotia, we're ahead in the hiring of Acadian, Black, and recent immigrants significantly. Uh, we don't have the information on the hiring of persons with disabilities, but we are falling behind on the hiring of Indigenous workers. I'm not saying we don't have lots of area for improvement, but that is a, an interesting story about how inclusive the sector is compared to the rest of the economy. And I'm sure nobody's surprised to learn that funding is our biggest challenge to growth. 
65% of the respondents to our survey said that it's a challenge. But the other challenges are almost all related to labor. So our staff are overworked. It's really hard to recruit volunteers and paid employees. It's hard to uh, retain them. We don't have adequate training and leadership development. And um, often we don't have pension and benefits programs um, for many of our organizations. And the last one I find intriguing, and I'll just spend a minute reflecting on that, uh, technology. Responding to technology was only identified as a problem for growth in 21% of the respondents to our survey. And I think that means they're not even able, because of all the other challenges, to focus on the role of technology. I don't think that means that they've got it ha handled very well. So I'll let the other panelists speak to that um, number, but I think there's a huge opportunity in exploring, is that technology an opportunity or is it a threat and how does it impact our ability to diversify our hiring? And um, I love this slide. Let me just, uh, it's saying here that labor shortages because of our aging demographic are a real challenge. So in 1980, for every 10 retirees in the Atlantic region, there were 24 available young workers. So a ratio of 24 to 10. Today, for every 10 retirees, there's seven young, employed, young workers available. So that's creating an unbelievable challenge across every sector of the economy. And it means the nonprofit sector is in direct competition with government and the private sector corporations for the hiring of talent. And uh, we know that recruitment is, a, is an ongoing challenge. So I'll just quickly uh, mention a little bit about the COVID-19 picture. I, it sounds like we've already discussed it in a previous one. But the Atlantic region has recovered 61% of the 171,000 jobs that were lost at the beginning of COVID-19. It's rebounding fairly quickly compared to the rest of the country. But there are still 67,000 fewer Atlantic Canadians working in July than there were in February. And women account for 54% of the job losses and it has the largest impact on women and children. And we do know that it's also disproportionately affecting um, young workers. So those under 25 are significantly more impacted and those with lower salaries. And we know there's a whole um, marginalized communities are being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and the recovery is not benefiting them as quickly. So in terms of my uh, wrap up comments here, I would say that the aging population and the labor shortages are creating what, I, you know, I come from a business school, the business case for intentionally uh, and proactively hiring members of traditionally marginalized communities. And the same with the leadership succession crisis I mentioned that we have a real opportunity for more diversity in our hiring as the seniors start to move on. I mentioned technology being um, either a threat or an opportunity, and I don't know that we know quite how that's going to unfold. Uh, but I would also say we need uh, real radical collaboration and how we're going to start to look at if we have 6,000 nonprofits, can we really sustain that? Do we need to look at mergers? Do we need to look at new ways of working and creative approaches? And we have to, as the whole theme of this conversation, we have to look at who's getting left behind and how the power structures are undermining our equity approaches. And of course, I do think that boards need to be on side and that there needs to be dramatic um, and creative innovation on how we address that. So that wraps up my comments and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Pat. That was a very nice uh, overview, I think. And, and some of the points you touched upon, we will come back uh, uh, as we discuss further, particularly one around uh, technology and the impact of technology on, on the sector and on inclusion. And the other point that uh, that you mentioned around uh, uh, making a business case uh, for that and, and around if you have a large number of uh, nonprofits, what value actually, what real value they bring to this conversation. <laughs> so definitely we'll come back to that. Now, let me go to... Uh, uh, Bradley, if you are ready. Your, your mic might, 
didn't it know. Be- I couldn't tell. I, I assume now that everybody's <laughs> just kind of sitting here silently looking around that that you were saying my name because my computer internet froze and then I come back to silence and somebody asking me to unmute. So um, I assume my name was said in there somewhere. Yes, yeah. <laughs> just it's, it's your five minutes for the initial introduction. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, hello, welcome. Um, wherever you are and whatever time zone you're in, um, I'm really honored and happy to be here to have a conversation. And um, I, I want to say that I go by he, him, his, my pronouns. And um, uh, I decided today to match my office color. I don't know how that happened. Even my glass is green. I don't know how that happened. You must be looking at me like this guy is obsessed with green. I don't know what's going on there. But um, yeah, no, um, a little bit about me and and what I'm up to. Uh, So I am the co founder and CEO of of a a few different social enterprises. And one of the founding uh, members uh, of of a nonprofit group uh, called ACE, which stands for arts, culture, community, and economics. Um, So I'm originally from Halifax. My family has been here since 1789. My seventh great grandfather came here. Um, And I'm fortunate to know a little bit of that history, but through, you know, a lot lot of years of displacement, it's really hard to say where sort of in Africa that side of my family would have been from, but I'm a part of a historic black community here in in Nova Scotia. I've, I've, uh, I've had the privilege of being decent at sports, which has, has allotted me to get a lot of different sort of opportunities to, to go to school and get an education and, and travel and live in different countries. Um, I don't have a fancy presentation, Pat, but you, you pretty much, you know, gave me an alley-oop because a lot of the stuff that you were talking about and uh, some of the challenges for the nonprofit sector in Nova Scotia are very much, um, uh, they, they uh, are very similar to some of the things that we're, we're helping address uh, through, through the work that we're doing at, uh, at both placemaking 4G and, and, uh, and cluster employment. So, so what are those things? So I'll start with P4G, which September will be a, a celebration for us. Well, it'll be three years operational. So that's, uh, that's something to say that we got through COVID and as such a young organization and we actually grew during that time. And so that, that's something we're, we're really proud of. Uh, and what it is, it, it's, it's a social enterprise recruiting firm. And so we kind of had uh, a lot of those statistics you're talking about, Pat, were also talked about in, um, in the one Nova Scotia report and the Ivany report, which was a report written here by a professor out of Acadia that just kind of said, what's going on in Nova Scotia and what do we need to do? And, and the aging demographic, the outmigration of youth, the lack of retention, those were, those were key issues that were outlined in that report and continue to be a, a challenge going forward. Um, so, you know, our response to that was to say, well, who's responsible for attracting, retaining young professionals in Atlantic Canada, okay? I guess it's this recruiting industry, let's check that out. And there wasn't a lot of great stuff going on in that sector, so we decided to kind of step in and, and shake things up and do things a little differently and, and, and approach things from a values perspective. Um, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, those aren't things that are sort of written on our wall, they're, they're sort of pillars that we live by on a day-to-day basis, and so, um, making sure that people's values are aligned with the work that they do is incredibly important to them feeling fulfilled and wanting to stay in that job. And so it's been our primary focus to um, uh, first and foremost, align the, the culture uh, with the individual coming in um, to, to said culture. So that's been, you know, an interesting journey over the last three years. We've had some, We've been fortunate, very fortunate to have some success and, and do a lot of great work for a lot of different organizations. And I would say that um, the majority of the roles that we have filled have gone to um, uh, the BIPOC community. Um, so, you know, we're doing our part in, in making sure that the roles we fill 
um, we, we have the power to put together or put you know, forward the shortlist of candidates. It's not often you're in a position where you can choose who gets selected as one of those shortlisted candidates. And you know, when you're having conversations with people and they don't even have the confidence to apply for a role because they've been told, they've been passed over so many ties, times, they've been told their whole life. So it's really interesting to, to build confidence for those individuals and, and now find them a home where they can feel safe and comfortable and welcome and belong and contribute to that culture. So that's the, the P4G side of things. And, and on the side, we've been funding the operations of clock Cluster employment, which is um, something we've uh, made a sprint to put a lot of resources behind. Um, if you go to clusteremployment.com, it is now live. You can create a profile. Um, so it is a, a new tech solution. Um, okay. Uh. Bradley, I think your internet <laughs> is either down or maybe you want to switch off the, I don't know if he's hearing me. Can you switch off your video, Bradley? Oh, well. yeah. I think we, we lost him. And maybe we'll, we'll get back to him. Uh, some very interesting uh, points he, he mentioned and, and definitely we need him back uh, to, to explain uh, the P4G model and, and what actually works in terms of uh, uh, providing access to the, he, he mentioned the word um, BIPOC community, so the black, indigenous, people of color community. So what works? I think that would be the question I would ask him when he comes back. All right, now let me go to uh, Jennifer, if you're, if you're ready. Yes, uh, thank you. And it's great to be able to be a part of this conversation just as uh, Bradley was uh, talking about. So I'm the CEO of ISIN's Immigrant Services Association of Nova Scotia. We're celebrating our 40th year this year. So we've had quite a long history uh, in this province and also working nationally in Canada to uh, support immigrants and refugees uh, to help them find and um, find and define their own unique pathway to settlement and integration. So very much looking at people as individuals with all of the capacity and opportunity that they bring when they come here to, uh, to Nova Scotia and helping them kind of see the way forward in terms of settling here in this uh, province. I'll just quickly run through uh, many of the services that we offer. We help immigrants and refugees settle well in uh, communities. We help them develop English language skills, find employment through a wide variety of programs, um, you know, including uh, job search skills and resume building and um, professional practice programs. Uh, we support employers in, in hiring uh, immigrants, and we have a program actually uh, that works in rural and small centers in Nova Scotia supporting employers right now. We connect immigrants and refugees to the community through a wide variety of programs, including community gardens, art-based programs, nature-based programs. We support immigrant entrepreneurs. We uh, build welcoming communities, and we do that in numerous ways by offering uh, workshops and programs around workplace culture to help uh, uh, develop workplaces that are more um, uh, sustainable and welcoming of newcomers, but also we do a lot of work in uh, communities helping people develop skills to uh, change their communities to be more welcoming. We have a Welcome Ambassador program. And we do this work uh, in person, although that has been very much restricted through COVID, although we reopened our offices and are beginning to offer in-person in work once again. We've done historically a lot of work online. So when COVID hit, we were able to transition many of our programs to a virtual delivery form. And we also do blended delivery. So both in-person and, uh, and through virtual. So we have a lot of experience in doing this. Um, we're based in Halifax in Nova Scotia, although we do have programs that extend across the province of Nova Scotia. We work actively in the Atlantic region and we also work nationally. Uh, so we develop uh, protocols and programs at a national level. 
And we also deliver programs pre-arrival, again, through virtual delivery. So people who are destined to come to Halifax and need to particularly to develop employment skills, we're able to work with them before they arrive to deliver those programs. So again, a wide, um, wide continuum of services we offer. Um, I'll just say three more things. Uh, the first one is that we work with many different groups. We have programs that focus on working with youth, with women, uh, with the LGBTQ plus community, with racialized persons. And really one of the things I wanna highlight as well is we work with children. We offer childcare services for parents who are taking courses and programs. So we have over 800 children in our care every year and we help them on their pathway to settlement and to citizenship in Canada. Um, the second thing I want to say is that we've been working very hard on an empowerment approach and how we deliver our services. And that is based on adult education principles. It's based on a trauma-informed and re uh, resilience-informed approach. So very much understanding that many of the people we work with come out of an experience of trauma. We use an EDI lens, so uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and we're developing resources and doing a lot of very big thinking about this right now, both internally for our own staff, but also externally in terms of the programs we offered. And we also work very hard on being as an organization, we have um, about 275, 300 staff to really try and deliver a holistic program in the delivery of our programs. Um, I think the last thing I'll say is that, and this is one of the things I think in terms of a strategy that's been very important for us is because we offer so many variety of services, we really work hard on doing a case management approach. And that really is pulling together people from different places in the organization with different skills and expertise, working with individuals to help them develop their unique pathway forward. So the case management approach is very significant to us in terms of how we deliver our programs and making sure we have that consistent holistic approach. So uh, maybe I'll just leave it at that. I'm very happy to be involved in the conversation and, uh, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. That was very nice. And I think uh, uh, if I go back to what Pat was saying uh, around uh, the number of people who are retiring and the number of people who are available to replace them, and I think the work that you are doing, bringing uh, it, it, or helping immigrants find find work, I think yeah, that's, a, that's an important thing that, that we can discuss as we move forward. But before that, uh, last but certainly not the least, I would like to call Brian and, and come and talk about <coughs> Autism Nova School. Kosia and, and, and what kind of work you do. Yeah, sure. Uh, so my name's uh, Brian Foster. I, I also want to echo what Bradley said and say that, uh, Patricia, your your uh, presentation felt uh, a little too familiar as you were hitting at some of those pain points and uh, opportunities. Um, so uh, I'm the operations director for the organization. That means that I oversee the day-to-day -day operations but I also help direct the research and advocacy um, portion. Uh, and uh, most relevant to the conversation day, I helped build the uh, growing uh, employment department within the organization. So thanks to the organizers and to the panelists uh, for the invite to participate and uh, contribute the um, persons with disabilities lens to the conversation really. Um, so Autism NS is a not-for-profit. It's uh, also a charity and it runs a, a couple social enterprises. Um, all of our work is focused on <clears throat> disability support service and advocacy. So the core of our mandate is inclusion. Um, we have, uh, it depends on the season because we are a big seasonal employer because of recreation programming, but it may, we have anywhere from 60 to 100 staff at any given time. Um, and that includes a lot of people uh, on the autism spectrum working with us across the province on a variety of programs and services. Those include things like uh, life and social skills, recreation programming, respite services, and much, 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 much more. Um, so we're also working with across the disability community locally and nationally and internationally to bring uh, innovations um, and best practices on the service side, but also some of the conversations about ethics, human rights, inclusion, diversity into the landscape here. Um, over the last five years, one of the most intense areas of focus for us has been supporting autistic job seekers and educating employers on what autism spectrum disorder or what we call ASD uh, means and what adaptations and accommodations in the workplace look like for people with disabilities. Our employment preparation skills alone, uh, programs alone are usually supporting dozens of people across the province at any given time. 
We also are running uh, one of the most individualized uh, person directed employment coaching programs for people with autism in the country. Uh, at any given time, we have anywhere from three to 10 employment coaches out in the labor market supporting people with employment adaptation and accommodation needs. So in the last uh, about 18 months, we've helped uh, 53 people connect to full-time paid employment um, and maintain relations with them. That's important because in the disability community, that's people doing real work for real pay. Um, so that's only the people that we support uh, moving into work. We also are working at any given time with about 36 people through um, employment search uh, and support group uh, uh, meetings um, that uh, work through a program called Career Quest and our employment supports group, which we only started actually as a response to COVID because we saw uh, a 54% 50 uh, layoff rate among people with ASD uh, in that period. So we started a support group uh, that has been generously supported through labor and advanced education. Um, but it's particularly interesting, I think, to this conversation because a lot of the clients who are coming through those programs um, would be people who uh, have an invisible disability. Um, for this segment of people, like a big question and wrestling point is how to disclose and how to have very difficult conversations about adaptations and accommodations uh, with your employer. So on that front, um, autism is a really particular disability. Uh, you know, some people have clear indicators or you would know immediately that they have a disability. Others you may not know, and they could easily present and clear with an employer uh, through an interview process without ever having to disclose. Um, and it's only when needs arise that we, we get involved and support them. So that brings me just to close with a little bit about our work with employers. Um, so we're not a typical employment, uh, disability employment agency. We don't do typical job development uh, with people we're working with. Instead, uh, we help people connect to our agency partners, including Nova Scotia Works agencies across the province. Um, and we help them develop healthy work search patterns. And at the same time, we run a program that is a national initiative that we're a participant in called Ready, Willing, Enable that generates opportunities for people with autism and intellectual disabilities. And in that program, effectively, our employer relations expert works with employers to gain commitments from those employers to hire inclusively. And then we act as a brokerage, making those opportunities available to all of our agency partners across the province. Um, so, on the employer front, we spend a lot of time educating employers on the benefits of inclusive employment, and I'm sure we're gonna get into that a little bit today. Um, we also, importantly, uh, take a business case approach in our work with employers, focusing on how uh, inclusive employment actually will, will, again, speaking to Patricia's presentation, how it can remedy some of the uh, labor market pinches that they're experience, experiencing, but they, it often means they just need to adapt and maybe change some of their practices um, and culture. Um, so our work developing employment opportunities, including through work with, that we've done with CEI, has spanned everything from grocery store stocking to the transportation sector through to long-term and elder care, library sciences, and we've even helped uh, uh, staff in um, uh, complex data analytics with some of the large tech firms. Um, so very diverse, uh, like the people we work with. Um, so that brings me to the final piece of work that we're doing with the Nova Scotia Career Development Association as well, which is um, we're actually currently training the Nova Scotia Works agencies across the province on how to uh, uh, better support in their own service offerings as an offer profits in most cases, um, how to better support uh, people with autism when they try to access employment support services in the province. So thank you to everybody for the invite and I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I, I think there are a lot of uh, points that you touched upon uh, the role that you are playing in many ways that bridges the gap uh, uh, between what the industry demands, what kind of uh, opportunities mm. are there and preparing uh, uh, people who are uh, normally excluded uh, from the workforce yeah. to have those opportunities. So we'll definitely come back to that. I see Bradley, you are back. Uh, and while you are gone, I see there are three questions who want to learn more about your model. So let me get back to you. Uh, quickly tell how uh, uh, P4G works 
and specifically uh, Bradley, if you can tell uh, what works uh, when you talk about the, the BIPOC community, uh, when, when you look at their inclusion. So what, in, in your experience of the three years, what approaches work? How do you actually make them uh, job ready and actually find, find employment? Yeah, so um, the, I guess, su success of um, connecting people from the African Nova Scotian community uh, to the, net, the uh, actual sort of job market has been one of actually having the trust of the community. And so I think there's a lot to be said um, engaging a firm that has people from the community that can, you know, gain the, the respect and trust of that community. So it, it's difficult to have a conversation with somebody that you don't know, especially when it comes to um, how trust has been broken so often, so frequently over the years. Um, a lot of, a lot of um, programs that have existed to uh, build skills, to build capacity, have fallen short and that there hasn't been a job on the other end of that. And so, again, it's, it's been a something where we're gonna help you, we're gonna build your skills, and then you go back to your community and you have the same network, you don't have a job, and it's like nothing happened. And people view you as lesser than um, uh, because there's, you know, been that, well, why do they, why does somebody need to build capacity? There's lots of people that have tons of capacity. I, I don't, uh, I don't think that is the issue. I think that the networks have been broken for so long. Um, you know, my purpose, my stated purpose in life is to connect communities through building trust. And I think if we can build trust on either side, then that's where, um, you know, we can, we can see some, some success on either end. So I, it's not some complicated formula or new program or anything. It, it's, it's conversations. It's, it's having conversations with people. It's building that trust. It's being from the community and having the community's best interests at heart. Um, I think a lot of the work I do outside of P4G allows me to have those levels of conversation as well, as far as being the founding member of a nonprofit that is focused on taking back the arts, culture, community, and economics in the black community. Um, just over maybe a month ago, we launched Buy Black, Buy Black Halifax. So if anybody saw that sort of campaign go by, that was, uh, we launched a, a, a product uh, that was put together by seven different black owned businesses in Halifax. And they all put one of their products into that box and we sold them we help market and sell those boxes and we were able to sell close to 300 generating $30,000 in sales for those seven businesses in two weeks. Um, the day we launched it, it made $10,000 in sales. So it was, um, they, not only the sales side of things, but there were 8,000 impressions on um, some of the social media stuff. So um, thousands of people, you know, saw their businesses, were able to look in that maybe they didn't want all seven products, but you know, the, the, uh, the businesses involved talked about how their sales went up dramatically. And so increasing, you know, market awareness and, and increasing um, sort of sales and growth for black owned businesses is also going to increase the amount of black owned jobs on the market as well, because um, people are hiring people from community. If you look at R&B Kitchen, whenever I go in there, you look back into the kitchen and it's like, oh, there's my cousin or there's, you know, so-and-so. And, and it's, uh, it's nice to see. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's a, you know, a one, it's never a one size fits all sort of solution. It, it's a culmination of a lot of different things I have on the go. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I directly answered that question or not, but um, that, that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Bradley. So uh, I think uh, step number one to addressing the issue uh, is accepting there is a problem with diversity, uh, inclusion, and equity. So f you have to actually uh, uh, see whether there is a recognition of that or not. So in that context, I want to start by asking uh, whether each one of you feel uh, there is growing recognition and better under understanding in private sector and in the government on the marginalization 
of uh, the traditionally uh, marginalized and excluded populations, be it uh, the, the BIPOC community that uh, Bradley mentioned or people with disabilities. And how uh, this has changed over the last few years. And anybody could start. Who wants to begin? Patricia? It's uh, a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm noodling that one. Um, you know, certainly 2020 uh, is a punctuation mark, I think, in our collective um, awakening uh, and understanding and the, um, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement and the moment that we're witnessing um, uh, emanating out of the states with the protests and the growing conversations certainly in the community sector council we've been doing a decolonization learning journey and trying to deepen understanding of, of indigenous community and, and the deep historical roots of genocide and so I'm hearing more conversations I'm uh, definitely seeing it trickling past the nonprofit sector into the corporate and government sectors. Um, but you know, these power structures are really entrenched. And I do worry that this is a, a bit of a blip. And then it's going to take a really concerted and systematic effort of intentionality to address the underlying power structures. So um, I'm, I'm heartened. I, I'm encouraged. I think we are seeing a commitment to uh, the sustainable development goals. I think we are seeing corporate leaders stepping up uh, and making commitments. We're seeing sports teams names finally changing as statues coming down and uh, you know significant change happening. Uh, but it's, is it getting to the deep structure and is it going to be sustainable? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Ryan? Yeah, I think um Sorry, there we go. I think I think uh, uh, Brad Bradley's point about networks is really interesting because um, uh, I think it it strikes to the the, the fact that um, uh, rec recognition of a problem is not action. I think in and of itself, and and I mean it, it definitely contributes to it. But we've had an interesting shift in language even within the disability community in the last five five seven years. Um, so take uh, the autism community specifically. So we have a, we used to have what was called autism uh, autism awareness month, and uh, it was a sort of provincially and nationally recognized month, and you know flags were raised over legislatures, and it made for great optics for politicians, and you know this probably sounds a little more cynical than it should sound, but the 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 point is that it, uh, taking the lead of of the self advocate community, we heard that we needed to shift it away from uh, the language of uh, acceptance and understanding and, and uh, or sorry, understanding and build it towards acceptance and actual inclusion. And I think, again, coming back to sort of Bradley's point about networks, it's, it's about building um, actual systems for action. And I think like this is the big thing that uh, will be interesting to see over, uh, you know, again, on Patricia's point, it'll be interesting to see how some of the energy that's coming out uh, and will um, translates into actual concrete concrete actions around um, in inclusivity and building spaces and patterns and habits and customs and culture in a way that um, maybe breaks down a lot of the um, really subtle power structures that that maintain practices that exclude people. Who wants to go next? Maybe Jennifer? Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Yeah, I, I would echo what uh, what people have said uh, so far, but also I think, um, you know, one of the things I think that's significant is that um, in understanding that we who have lived here, uh, particularly in, in terms of welcoming immigrants and refugees, need to understand that we need to change ourselves. And I think there's a big kind of thing of looking at immigrants and refugees as sort of almost commodities. They will come in and meet the labor market needs and they will meet our need and, you know, move forward and help us move on our economic development. Um, as opposed to understanding that people are coming just like people have, if you're not an indigenous person, people have for centuries come for many different reasons and, and have an immigrant story themselves when they, when they, uh, 
that they may not fully understand and that you know the process of really um, uh, welcoming and integrating is the process of understanding that we all need to change that we all need to grow in this and so I think one of the things that we try to work very hard on is opening up those spaces for people to be able to reflect on what that is to provide opportunities to to move forward we're having an interesting discussion in our in our uh, organization of you know we often talk about cultural competence that's where we want to uh, you know perhaps you know be working moving from cultural awareness to cultural competence, but really looking at that space of cultural humility and uh, not making uh, kind of the assumptions that we have that it's really a skill that we learn. It's a lifelong process of engaging both with ourselves and with our community around really understanding uh, the, the, everyone who is around us, no matter what community they're coming from. Iceland's vision, it's interesting. Uh, it's always struck me. I've only been with the organization for four years. Its vision says a community where all can belong and grow. It doesn't mention immigrants or refugees. The vision is a community where all can belong and grow. So it's been both exciting, but also challenging for us to engage in many different places with that, the LGBTQ plus community, uh, with women, with you know a variety of, 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 of um, unique and, and groups that are looking for their opportunity to, to be themselves and to really offer the gifts and skills that they have. Mm -hmm. Bradley, you have something to add? Any changes you are seeing in the private sector or in the government? Uh, beyond the fact that I've been asked to be on about 10 boards since there's been <laughs> the Black Lives Matter movement had a resurgence. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it, it always runs the risk of being topical for a few months and then just uh, sitting on everybody's back burner while um, we never have the luxury of, of that back burner moment. And so you have people that are kind of fighting for these things that are just exhausted. And, um, you know, there's this concept of allyship. And I, I, read a, I read an article about how allyship was, was a myth. And I, I, I agree with that. And that how can you be an ally sort of to a problem that you created? how how do you how do you be an ally to that so it's it's not black folks responsibility to fix racism and have people that aren't black be an ally to that that's not what it is right and so it's um it, it's and it's exhausting so you know there's there's things that until we get to a point where you know, when it's not the BIPOC community leading the charge on this, it's, you know, still going to be very difficult to sort of shift the mindset of the masses, if you will. Um, so, so that's, you know, a, a small thought in a lot of things that I could say about sort of that whole topic. But, um, and then, you know, personally, I mean, it's, uh, I can, can only control what I can control. And, and so I, I tend to focus on how I feel I can have the biggest impact in, in, in doing whatever it is I'm doing. So um, if my energy is best spent somewhere to make um, larger change and I'll spend it there, but sometimes it just can be exhausting. So, you know, I'm not always gonna allow myself to, uh, exert a lot of energy shifting one mind because they're ignorant to something. And so it's not on me to do that. It should be on sort of everybody. And I, I, uh, I agree with your, your point, Jennifer, in that, you know, that's why we always say I'm on another sort of working group that is looking at African Nova Scotian unemployment, the youth unemployment lab. Um, and you know, we always say that this is a Nova Scotia problem, not an African Nova Scotian problem. And so that's, that's always been something and you, you kind of mentioned that this is something that is welcomes everybody and not just, you know, uh, a, a particular group because it's, it's not just a problem that is, that is uh, of one demographic. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, yeah, thank you. And I think going back to what uh, Patricia was uh, saying as well, uh, initially that, okay, th this, this might be a, a moment where you are seeing a lot of uh, things and, 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 and this could be a, a blip and, and things could go, go back to normal. So uh, my question is that given that uh, as an organization, uh, be it ISENS or, or Autism Nova Scotia, you are very focused uh, in ensuring that the, the group that you work with uh, has access to, uh, to opportunities and, and, and employment, and you're very inclusive. If you look at the presentation that uh, Pat made, um, the sector itself is very, very inclusive. Okay, and the sector can be a role model for the private sector. How how you how you can how they, they can be inclusive. So going forward, looking more in terms of the future of work, uh, what role you think uh, specific role nonprofits and social enterprises can play? Given your strength, what would be the main strength of of, of for example nonprofits uh, that okay uh, to ensure that the future workplaces are more inclusive and equitable? Well, I mean, I, I, th I think that like, um, uh, not-for-profits have a sort of di disproportionate responsibility, I think, to like walk the walk on this stuff. Um, we, we have to be pretty mindful about, about uh, you know, not, not going out into the, into the private sector or with working with government and telling them that they should adapt certain practices or be inclusive in a certain way or change the way that they look at challenges uh, around diversity and marginalization and then not do it ourselves. So I, th I think like, you know, the, we, we spend a lot of time at ANS talk, talking about these as uh, we call them reflexive practices, things that make us, make us hold a lens up to what we're doing ourselves, um, how we're building uh, our own organization. And um, so I think in that respect, the not-for-profit sector ha has a leadership role that I think is sometimes understated. And, you know, Bradley's work actually, you know, and the sort of multitudinal, <laughs> like, sorry, I'm kind of picking on you here, Bradley, but like the sort of like multiple sort of issue or problem focused sort of uh, uh, initiatives that, that he's been involved in points to the fact that there is a, there's a flexibility and nimbleness in the not-for-profit sector um, as a response to certain challenges that, that, that um, really can be a model for the, the private sector and for government as well, which often is pretty slow to move on some of this stuff. <laughs> uh, I mean, as an employer, but also as a, as a large bureaucratic entity. So I, I think, um, I think uh, that, that's a key piece is that we have to model model the the things that we want to see uh our collaborators partners people or the organizations we're working with do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anybody else like to get a crack at that question and, uh, and i i'll sorry jennifer go ahead go, no go ahead i just think we have to be not complacent because the sector also um, is underfunded system, you know, systematically raising money is still the number one challenge getting resources. So we do fall into competition. We do fall into old patterns of working. And I think um, often we're blind to a lot of issues. So I think we have to be careful um, to both model, but to be brutally honest with ourselves on where we can do better and where the opportunities um, for collaboration with each other uh, and reaching out to traditionally marginalized uh, communities. Um, I think a lot of the, the leadership, I said, we've got a succession challenge. Most of the, the majority of the leaders in the sector are over 55. You know, I wonder at what point we become the elders and we mm -hmm. move over and make space and make sure that we're intentional and who's filling those roles and who's in that pipeline uh, and then partnering. Uh, that's why I love what P4G is doing with the cluster employment and, and being much more intentional about leveraging technology and some of the exciting new opportunities of technological disruption for how we, how we collaborate, not just within the sector, but across the sector into the private sector and uh, into, um, into government as well. So I, I don't know that I directly answered the question, but I, it's tough work. Um, and we've got to pick it up and and not be afraid of those hard conversations. 
So there are a lot of questions coming now. So let me, uh, let me just pick up a few questions. You know, we have a lot of international uh, participants who have joined. And I think there's one question. Uh, what types of role need to be played to improve inclusion in employment by local governments, particularly in the, in the uh, context of COVID? And uh, I think uh, the question is more about uh, if you think of women in remote areas like how they could be, uh, they could be included uh, in, in, in opportunities. So who would like to take that? I never really got an opportunity to explain cluster employment and I, I was just about to before I cut off. <laughs> but um, uh, I'll explain the concept and then I, I, I kind of want to touch on a couple things. Um, so we've done a lot of work recruiting and because we're in the social sector and 60% of our profits go back into community, we have that sort of network of, of being in this sort of the social sector. And so a lot of the work we've done and a lot of the conversations we have are with nonprofits or with social enterprises. And again, access to talent was something, you know, we'd love to be able to use your recruiting services, but who has the budget for that? You talked about sort of the, the budget issues, um, Pat, it, it previously, and that and access to talent being the other side of that. So you've got an overworked staff who, you know, in, in, in a small budget where you can attract more talent. Um, so we said, why don't with that, you know, 0.25 of a budget that you have, why don't you, you know, uh, merge with other businesses that have, or, or nonprofits, organizations in general, um, that have a business need um, and pool your resources together to create full FTE jobs, right? Um, so that was, you know, a concept, an idea. And for about two years, we ran pilots of it. And um, so what was happening was you'd have two small nonprofits or family run organizations in a rural community partner with a social enterprise in Halifax to hire, you know, a master's graduate. And it was beautiful. They were getting a level of, um, a level of, you know, talent that they weren't used to in, with five hours a week in, in New Ross, Nova Scotia. Um, but that's all they need and that's all they have a budget for. And the great thing about it is that it still is recognized as a full-time job. So you still get EI, you still get CPP, you still, you, you, every job that is created through cluster will have benefits. Um, it is also uh, uh, still eligible for any wage subsidies. So things like graduate to opportunity, um, you know, all of the different sort of wage subsidy, government wage subsidy programs, it's still available for that. So you can, not only are you cost sharing between two to three different employers, you're also, you know, still potentially Reducing, reducing the cost if you're able to, you know, get a wage subsidy on top of that. Um, so you're really paying a small fraction of what you would be um, in order to attract talent. And so that can be, you know, a partial solution to what you're talking about, Pat, in, in the labor demands of the nonprofit sector and how they're able to get high level talent and pay them good money um, because they're able to cost share. And um, the other part of that was we made a, a big push because at the beginning of COVID, we realized with a million people on EI, this was going to be difficult to get, you know, doors back open again. And I think that, you know, this can be the difference between opening your doors and not opening your doors. Um, if you're able to take advantage of this cost sharing. Another thing you mentioned, Pat, was the collaboration piece. Now we have, you know, one of our pilots was Veith House in Africville. And for so long, they serve a lot of people in the same demographic, in the same communities. They've never done work together. And now they're going in on bids together. They have a fund developer that is, you know, raising funds for both of those organizations, increasing what they're able to do. They're having conversations about how they can collaborate. And, you know, that amount of collaboration, that amount of um, working together is what is necessary, especially in our rural communities. So, Specific to your question about um, how does that affect, let's say, a woman in a, in a you know, rural area. Well, these jobs aren't just 
um, physically be there jobs, they can be remote work as well. Um, so you could live anywhere in, in the province and work for anyone in the province. Um, and, to and, and COVID has taught us that if it's taught us anything. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to explain kind of the concept of that and our response to sort of, I mean, it was always in response to, to a need, but now you, it, it growing and increasingly it's responsive to sort of what uh, the circumstances uh, that we find ourselves in as a result of kind of COVID. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I saw, I think Jennifer, also wanted to jump in on that one, Jennifer? Yeah, so, so maybe just uh, shifting a little bit uh, to, to some practical things that we've, um, we've been looking at. I think we're very interested, for example, in looking at micro-credentialing, right? So this particularly for people who are unable to go to uh, university for extensive periods of time, but what does that, what does that type of uh, program or you know, approach offer people who uh, can move quickly into a place that have a specific kind of skill or, or, or experience that actually enables them to do, to do a job. So that's, I think, a strategy that I think uh, we're, we're very interested in exploring. Mentorships are huge all across the board. They make such an incredible difference for people in terms of really being able to be with someone who has the same work experience and to just all of the relationship and the rich basis of experience that they're able to combine. So that's a huge thing. Um, co-op programs, we don't work so much on co-op programs. We do have um, wage subsidy programs and professional practice programs, but all of that type of model of someone going into workplace, being able to test and experience and, and uh, have their credentials uh, recognized uh, in terms of what they bring. Um, and also things like programs such as the English in the Workplace program, which we have been using for quite a while. So having very specific tailored programs on site to support uh, um, a person in a job working through their employer, often around kind of soft communication skills. We found through COVID, one of the huge challenges uh, is digital literacy. Uh, number one, and when, so when someone's asking about rural women, having actually access to the internet and having broadband access is huge. Having access to the actual technology to be able to access you know, the, the, the internet. Having the digital literacy skills to be able to, uh, to you know, engage in programs. There was a whole group of people left out because all of a sudden everything moved online, right? And that worked well for some of us and it was fantastic. And we at ISENS actually put a lot of our programs on virtual delivery and we're really um, excited and challenged and proud of what we were doing. But it's also important to realize that there are people who cannot connect for numerous different reasons and what happens to them, particularly where we see in the pandemic where there's a total lockdown. And so I think our commitment around digital literacy has become much more of a, of a, a huge thing. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that I think, um, you know, Canada has had for about 40 years an essential skills framework. They're now reviewing it at a national level and it's called Skills for Success. And it's really looking at what are the skills that people need. So I think one of the important things is the value of information, understanding both who I am myself, what are the skills I have, how can I talk about that, and understanding where the labor market is going and being able to work yourself around that. So it's a very interesting and evolving uh, kind of place, but I think there's a lot of value in um, working with people and, and kind of accompanying people on their own self journey about uh, what are the skills that they have and then uh, offering opportunities such as micro-credentialing or more in-depth programming to be able to actually uh, move forward with some tangible things. So I'll leave it as that. Yeah, I think about this micro-credentialing uh, as a strategy, um, uh, my co-facilitator Farooq, who's also there, uh, he, has a, he has a point. Farooq, can you turn your mic on, please? Uh, yes, Simon, can you hear me there, Yogesh? Yes, 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 yeah. I was just going to say, you know, one of the things that Yogesh and I have noticed uh, uh, as we've been doing a little bit more analysis in this area is, uh, particularly from the U.S., there's been a study by McKinsey <clears throat> that shows uh, as technology begins to enter the workplace, uh, the sectors where the BIPOC community is represented in larger numbers are probably going to be affected the greatest. Mm -hmm. 
So in the service sector, for example, in the hospitality sector, we've noticed that you know, the, the impact is going to be disproportionate in the BIPOC community. And I think you know, the, the micro-credentialing idea would be a great strategy to be able to help them to, to pivot towards new, uh, uh, new opportunities. Um, and, and it's wonderful to hear that you're thinking about it. It was just a comment I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, if I can actually connect into that. So we, we um, with COVID uh, in the disability community, I mean, the disability community the, and people who are employed uh, were like, I, I can't overstate how devastating COVID was to employment for people with disabilities. Um, and it goes to what Fruit sort of mentions in, uh, in literature, they, they call it patterns of precarity. So people who are in like precarious employment, so often like low, lower paying, more precariously, like uh, more casual based hours, other things. And these, for, for the disability community, these are often the positions that people are pigeonholed into uh, as people with disabilities if they if they engage with the labor market as a person with a disability, right? So they're, they are sort of put into these um, entry level, very vulnerable, precarious positions. And the result is that whenever the labor market pivots, they, they bear the brunt of the shift disproportionately, whereas everybody in those sort of full-time, um, full-time, uh, more permanent positions tends to endure the shifts a little bit better. And I mean, I don't think that's a disability unique reality. I think most marginalized communities are probably going to nod their head that that's like, that's what happens is that, you know, uh, immigrants, uh, the black community, the indigenous community, they, they're going to disproportionately like take, take the hit. I mean, I, I think like, it's important to say that like, not-for-profits can do a lot um, in order to like help move the landscape tw towards like a service a service system that allows for faster pivots to adapt to the labor market. But I also think that ultimately we part of that capacity building that we need to do as not-for-profits is work with the private sector so that like they understand that the onus is not entirely on the communities that are marginalized <laughs> to 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 like adapt to those things that like em employers have a responsibility and, and government has a role in this as well. I think, you know, particularly provincially and federally to, to think about regulatory frameworks around some of this stuff um, and around patterns for, for example, like pro procurement, right? So like, you know, um, there's been some really interesting initiatives like around the Nova Scotia shipping contract to make sure that like, um, uh, people of color um, and I think there was indigenous contracts as well. And they were actually on procurement for these large government contracts. The, they, they were actually weighted uh, as uh, higher in the procurement process with the federal government because they had a plan for engaging marginalized communities. And I think that those are the sort of like concrete actions that, that I think like employers need to take. I, I think, you know, there's definitely things we as not-for-profits need to do and we need to model change, but ultimately like, employers need access to expertise as well. Um, like what, for example, placemaking and other organizations are doing to act as sort of like recruitment partners that connect people into networks and solutions that maybe go beyond what they're typically used to doing. Because like HR departments and large organizations can be incredibly effective, but they can also be incredible sort of like like weights that hold people to old ways of doing things. It, so unless they can get exposed to new practices and new promises. So I, I, I you know, I want to, I feel the need to sort of push some of this back on to the private sector and government. Cause I, I think like not for profits, we can, you know, be the change all we want on this, but ultimately it's going to, it's going to take some initiative from those sectors to meet us halfway on some of this stuff. And I just Sorry, Brian, I just wanted to quickly respond. I mean, I think that the point is well taken. Um, if I can just push you a little bit further, Brian, it, it's, it's, a dangerous, it's a dangerous question to ask you, but are you, are you talking about affirmative action? Is that what you're suggesting in terms of what private sector and government needs to do? I mean, I don't know if I would frame it as affirmative action. I think, like, I, I, I think that like, this is about sort of like, uh, like, you know, if we can watch what's going on in Canada, it's not just in the U.S., but in Canada and, and here with protests and, and the, the, the larger sort of uh, uh, civil rights movements, um, access to economic participation, and we, we in the disability community have known this for a long time, access to economic participation is not about, you know, a, a affirmative action within us. It's a human right, right? And I think for us, that's an important, an important piece. So I think that, like, 
uh, affirmative action is often what happens when we sort of expect private sector to move without a regulatory framework around some of this stuff. Um, I think there certainly needs to be a conversation about the actions that need to be taken. I don't know, I, like they could be framed as, as, as affirmative action, but fundamentally this comes down to culture transformation. <laughs> That's hard. It's really hard, but, but again, like government and private sector have a role to play in that. And I think they often, um, and I, I say this with the like genuine love and respect for our private sector partners, because a lot of them have taken this on, but they'll often sort of push it off and say like, well, that's not really what, what we do. And sure, you have a business bottom line, but you also do have a, a corporate citizenship responsibility on this. It goes way beyond, um, way beyond that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers the question. Sorry for you. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Farooq, I think Bradley also wanted to make a point. Bradley? Yeah, um, it, it uh, kind of got lost because there's so many interesting things being said. Sorry. But, yeah, um, there's, there's, I guess, there's so many things in the chat box as well. Yeah, put, <laughs> to that point, I mean, um, I, I think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of social entrepreneurship. And I've been now to a few different social enterprise world forms. And I just, I think that that's the way that the world needs to go and the capitalism is broken. So call it affirmative action, call it whatever you want. When we don't live in an equal society, we can't obtain equality. So we need to strive for equity. And if that means that we're placing higher value on people that are underrepresented in workplaces, then that's what it should be. Um, now, as far as creating more safe spaces for those people, because you talked about, essentially you're talking about gig workers earlier, when you talked about people that are at risk, it's the gig economy, which is huge in, in Canada and in the US. We have people piecing together these part-time jobs. Um, a pandemic happens and they don't have EI because none of them were paid EI because they all worked part-time. Um, they're not recognized as full-time employees. And we have these two structures right now. We have full-time jobs that are secure and that everybody wants. And then we have this gig economy. There's no in between. And so that's sort of what we realized and that's what we are striving for with cluster employment is how can we give that flexibility of the gig economy and wrap the structure and security and benefits around it to provide more safety and more health for people that are marginalized. So, you know, if you look at, uh, there was a study, I think in 2017, on, done by Nova Scotia Disabilities. I'm not sure, don't quote me, but it, it laid out the three priorities in the disability community, which were adequate income, access to healthcare, and, and access to employment. And that, that growing gig economy and urbanization of that is something that is not accessible to, to marginalized people in general the, the disabled community is a part of that, right? So um, how can we make it accessible to everyone um, where it makes sense for people to work for three different organizations and they have benefits and they have a salary and they have security and they're eligible for EI. So those were the things that were really important for us on the individual side of things, not to mention all the benefits to the uh, actual sort of employment place that they're working at. Anyway. Um. Okay, thank you. I think um, <clears throat> we are almost reaching time and I want to hand it over to Jamie um, at least five minutes before we have to close. Uh, I have one final question um, uh, and it's sort of combination of what I'm uh, looking at because there's so many questions that are coming up in the chat. So I think uh, uh, Pat in, in her presentation highlighted like how challenging it is to work in the nonprofit sector fundraising, community outreach, reporting, uh, ensuring there is, there is inclusion. So it's, it's, it's really hard. And I know when you are working that intensively in the, in the nonprofit and social enterprise sector, it's really hard to look at the, the big questions like future of work or technology. So what you think, uh, and it's, it, it could be a very short answer, what role you think um, academic institutions like, uh, like ours, like universities, uh, help uh, um, help you in answering some of those questions. 
Well, I, I think what you're doing right now is a help. <laughs> I think these kind of conversations are really important because uh, it raises our gaze. It allows us to ask those bigger questions and step back and reflect both individually and collectively. Uh, but I think the research is important and I think the research that's community-based, that's a kind of collaborative action research where we're in the questions together and we're working um, in a new partnership. And often, and I'm glad you asked the question because universities get left out. We talk about the nonprofit sector, social enterprise, government, and business, and we leave out the critical role that the academic institutions have um, in, in bridging and elucidating and giving language and helping to reveal a lot of the science, silence power dynamics. So kudos to you guys for a wonderful event and for doing these conversations. Thank you. Anybody else? Jennifer, you have? Sorry, yeah, I, I think the, um, the other opportunity is to, is access to information that's accessible, right? I think that's a huge, huge thing. And uh, the research is really important and understanding and collecting data and understanding and providing that. But I mean, I'm, I'm really glad Pat mentioned the community-based approach and then how that information is accessible to people so they can own it and understand themselves. That is huge if I think uh, for people to have the confidence and the sense of engagement that yes, I can take, like there's social agency in, in, in each of us to be able to say, I can, I understand and I can take this forward. And so uh, we've had many, uh, Pat and I have had many conversations about, you know, uh, using different methods of infographics and information and just really exploring how you can uh, uh, pass information on to people so that it's, uh, it's available in there about, you know, what does the future of work mean, you know? Some Sometimes I'd use resources from RBC because it's very practical one-liner kind of sort of things that are just really kind of accessible. So it's, it's just really that would help us, I think, as a, as a uh, you know, settlement agency working is to have a multiple uh, layer of resources that really help us, you know, think and, 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 and provide information to people in this critical time. It'd be really important. Great. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, increase representation from marginalized communities on your staff and faculty, period. Hmm. Okay. okay, Brian. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna go back to Brad's, or Bradley's point about um, uh, networks. I think like one of the big, one of the big challenges and promises of, of university, I'm lucky I'm married to a professor, right? So I, I know I know all of the, people who are doing various areas of research, I know how to tap into them in order to mobilize certain areas of like to align maybe a my tax grant or a, you know, to how to get that funding, how to, but I, I don't think every organization has that benefit. And I think that that point about networks is really important. Like the universities uh, do, do maybe need to, yeah, it's actually funny. Uh, Ray Ivany who wrote the help write the Royal NS report said that, you know, universities and colleges are almost at their foundation community building exercises. And I think that like, we need to think about though that sort of mission is aligned with what the community sector is doing. Um, but we, part of that is the university does have a responsibility to bridge all of that expertise out and to make it available to the community, either, even just through like, uh, you know, a clearer, uh, outline of what people do and what projects they're working on and where those because I, I think there's a lot of not-for-profits that would benefit from partnerships and building partnerships with that, those academic functions but they're not really sure how to tap into it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, all of you. You know I, I, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Jamie now uh, so she can properly thank you and, and do, uh, uh, do a wrap-up. This has been a fascinating conversation and we look forward to having more of these uh, and, and Jamie will tell you about that. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Jamie over to you. Thank you very much Yogesh. I just needed a, a moment to uh, unmute myself which is I'm famously uh, known for not unmuting myself. So thanks for that little pause. And thank you so much to everyone who's joined us uh, for the conversation today. And as Bradley mentioned at the top end, what, whatever time zone you are in and where you are in the world, thank you for being with us. We certainly appreciate it and very grateful for the, the conversation. Uh, thank you to all of the panelists who are able to share your insights with us today. 
and also challenge us, challenging us to think about how we deepen our work as uh, within the institution and academia and the roles that we play of, of convening and, and sharing, disseminating and working and walking alongside uh, communities. So thank you all very much for that today. Um, I think we're very fortunate at uh, the Cody Institute and Extension Department to think about how we continue to build upon the 90 plus years of community building and working uh, with communities and learning with and from communities and in, in the um, efforts that we do engage in. So uh, more for us to bring back and to think about ourselves and to provide, I, I think it was um, perhaps Jennifer who talked about the reflexive opportunities and to really think about uh, the work that we do together. And also to think about the way that social innovation plays a role in this and, and bringing together those different components, whether it's community, business, uh, academia, institutions, and, and others, and thinking through the opportunities as well as government. I would like to thank as well uh, the province of Nova Scotia, Labour and Advanced Education for their continued support and work with the Centre for Employment Innovation at Cody and Extension at the University and the work that we do with Nova Scotia Works, others, and many other organizations like ISANS and the community sector councils and others uh, here within the province of Nova Scotia. And uh, finally, thank you to you, Yogesh, uh, for hosting us today and Farouk as well. Looking forward to the course offering, as I mentioned and put in the dialogue box. Uh, there is a link there for the Future of Work and Workers course that's going to be offered online beginning in September and very excited about that opportunity. I know there are some folks that I met with in the last few days who will be in that course with you, so hoping others might also think about joining in. And the many other offerings uh, that will be available online to local participants globally. So look forward to having that to you. And finally to Kate Thompson and Brian Lazuri for bringing us all together and the technical supports. Uh, we certainly couldn't do this work without you. So thank you all so much. I'm really uh, excited about the conversation and going to be thinking quite a bit about the comments that have come up today and look forward to following up with you all soon. There will be another webinar over the next month and we look forward uh, to reaching out to all of you at that time. Thank you very much.